Sweet. Okay. So I've been a little here last year talking to you to you about um, the crazy things that we were doing with resilvering. Um, the so this presentation is just, just going to be a quick uh, sort of catch up to where we are now, where we where we've gotten in a year, and what the status of, is of the promises that we, that I've made last year. So last year I. Um, the state of the project was in basically it was a pile of relatively fresh code that still had been under head development. So the many of the performance numbers and many of the sort of assumptions in there in that uh, presentation were kind of tentative at that point. Since then, we have progressed a little bit. But before I get into that, for the one person here probably that's left that doesn't know how Resolver works under the hood, I got uh, some slides that Resolver from last year. Which, are, which should probably explain that. I'm basically going to add on to what Tom was talking about in his talk about the uh, talk about the re, the sort of prefetcher, and so I'm going to take it a little bit more tutorially. Um, basically, the way that scrubbing and resilvering works is that it traverses uh, the data hierarchy, the metadata and the data hierarchy, and uh, basically what Tom's important stuff. Tom's code basically operates from sort of uh, this level up, so replicable work, basically from the metadata up. So it'll basically work for traversing any kind of like metadata processing and try to prefetch that. Uh, what I was looking at was trying to work out a good way to get resilver performance up. So the problem basically was resilver is logical block order in terms of the, the, the way that the data is arranged. Really simply said, it's essentially just a sequential file read. It reads the file, goes on to the next one, reads the file, goes on to the next one, and it does that simply in the way that the file is laid out. So essentially, uh, the as the individual buffers are sort of lay, laid out logically is the way that it generates I/O. It waits on the I/O to complete, generates some more I/O, it's not to complete, and so on and so forth. That is perfect if you have a mostly sequential rough layout. So on initial writing, the logical order that the blocks appear in in the sort of metadata layout is approximately the way that it'll, that, that it'll look like on disk. So if you just order, issue them all in order, it'll be fantastic. It'll run really well. You'll get awesome performance, and all will be well with the world. Unfortunately. Many workloads don't look like that, or many pools don't look like that, especially after a little bit of use. Because as you rewrite data, especially when you're running things like databases and VMs, those tend to rewrite individual pieces of your file, and, though, and the pieces then don't actually get, of course, allocated in place. They get copied over to some other place. But what you end up with, what you end up with is that if you go in order, in logical order, to the lower part, is you end up essentially hitting all kinds of like strange paths through the code. And so what the disk ends up seeing is just a whole bunch of out of order LBAs coming into it. So this will go ahead and service one part and the other, then and, and basically it'll jump back and forth, totally demolishing your read throughput on your scrub and resilver. So you can easily end up with a hard drive that normally is a, in a sequential IO would be able to do 100 plus megabytes a second. You'll be getting like 10 which is kind of bad. So the, the way that we had solved that was by introducing a reordering, in-memory reordering queue that does its best to basically pull the IOs back into order. Um, so rather than the IO going straight from the scrubber and resilver traversal of the metadata, Oh, cool. Um, anyway, so the um, so the way that we've done it is we put in a reordering queue uh, that completely decouples the metadata traversal from the actual reads being issued for the data blocks to the disks. And this is pretty much the state of the code about a year ago. Um, as I said, it was a pile of rather experimental stuff, and. Uh, we, since then, we've run into a bunch of trouble. Initially, I was 
completely confident we were going to be able to keep the data format unchanged on this, so you'd be able to go back and forth between the old implementation and the new one. Uh, then there was kind of a bunch of questions about that, but fortunately we got that resolved. And so the progress that we've done since uh, last OpenZFS was that by February, we had shipped that uh, change in our Nexena store 5.0 release, and anything past that uh, basically uses that as a new default algorithm. There is a way to go back to the old one if you really, really, really want to, but there's basically there's basically no advantage to going with that. So the other thing is that we were able to preserve this format. So if uh, so, there's no basically penalty for uh, booting back and forth between the old implementation and the new one. We have uh, also involved Matt and George in some of the design work. So it wasn't quite a complete review, but I think we got most of it straightened out. And uh, we also got some help over from Tom and Dado, who uh, were crazy enough to port that thing over to ZFS on Linux while it was sort of still hot and boiling. And uh, yeah, they, they got to work on it. And they put it, <laughs> Tom was basically running the thing. Uh, he ran into some performance troubles, and then he, that's where the prefetcher change idea c came out of, is that he saw some terrible performance on, on, on ZFS on Linux and just had to resolve that. So that's an awesome, awesome uh, piece of work that just came out of some crazy guy I mean, who, who, who just wanted to go ahead and experiment. So let's talk about a little bit about performance numbers. This is the slide that showed uh, last year. Those were the big, big promises. And of course, it wasn't the only slide that I showed. But th this was sort of the top end of the uh, performance delta. So we were getting like crazy multipliers of uh, on really, really badly randomized pools. The new pro improved algorithm was like just million the light years ahead, and uh, so the real, the real, little bit more real numbers is that something that we sort of, oh, those two lines should have been a different color down here. Whatever. Uh, so the, the slightly more realistic numbers that we got ultimately once we run ran this in production and ran this on systems that have been actually used, we got a little bit closer to like two to three x roughly in terms of improvement. Because realistically, the uh, deployed, deployed systems are never quite as badly randomized as you know something that you can play around with when you get, when you put the bench on it for me. Uh, there's another, and we got a whole bunch of customer systems. I didn't really bother listening out the details on this, but basically, we fall roughly within the two to three x improvement mark. And uh, we've also done a bunch of other testing where we quantify how the performance looks in terms of the proportion of sequentiality that you have on your pool. So the way that we measured this is basically out of all the I.O. that would go into Z pool, rather, the, I'm sorry, the I.O. that was generated from the sequential re-silvering, uh, the, all the blocks in, as they go in order, which ones are roughly close together, clumped, and so we probably consider those to be reasonably sequential, and which ones aren't. So 100% would obviously be completely sequential, in which case the new implementation is completely or almost totally identical to the old implementation, and as you basically get further down on the proportion of sequentiality, so you get more randomized stuff on the pool, the old scrub method, and we also have the numbers for Resilver, which pretty much look the same because it's almost the same algorithm. Um, the old algorithm just blows up and, and just completely starts hitting a wall, whereas the new algorithm is essentially almost, almost constant time, which means that we're getting pretty good sequentiality and aggregation. And so that's pretty much all I have. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them there. The, the numbers you gave, were those including Tom's work? Um, some of them yeah, some of them no. Um, there's, there was a bunch of uh, systems that had it, some of them didn't have it. So um, I think most most of these systems did have his work, although some of them didn't. So uh, there's a there's a bunch of experimental work that was done before we changes over. So a few of these were gathered. 
for those, old, these are somewhat older numbers that I know that we gathered uh, during the early courses of the year, which I know didn't include Tom's changes. So on the Lumos, I, I don't think that it's been that much of a change. I think it, it has something to do more with the way that Linux did its work. Cache size. Gap, gap size. Uh, gap size. Um, and what's the tunable gap size? Gap size. Um, the tunable gap size is um, an internal parameter that we've been playing around with. Um, basically, it's right now fixed to two, but it is changeable on the fly if you really, really want to. The gap size expresses how close together I/O has to be to be considered um, part of one contiguous extent. So, because the scanner basically gets random extents all over the pool, it's building sort of a, um, a an extent clustering image of where stuff is roughly clustered up. And so, anything that's closer together than two megabytes is going to be considered part of the same logical extent. And so, playing around with that, you get sometimes better aggregation, sometimes worse, sometimes better performance, sometimes worse. So we sort of settled on some sort of median value that seems to make sense, but in m the most testing scenarios. Awesome. Thank you very, thank you very much.